All right, everybody, welcome to the Remnant Call, and Brother Benjamin Brooks on here with us tonight. We're going to bring him in in just a moment. Um, but tomorrow night, we are going to do a special Remnant Call broadcast, and we are going to have a um, special guest, not only Brother Benjamin Baruch, but also Jeffrey Nyquist, to talk about recent developments with Russia and the United States and what's going on out there. And if you've never heard uh, Jeff and Benjamin together, well, you're going to be in for a real treat uh, those two minds uh, have a lot to share uh, with the whole geopolitical and uh, also, Benjamin, especially from a spiritual uh, point of where we are at in this world and what is the dangers of going on. Anyways, uh, tune in tomorrow night as we have a special Remnant Call broadcast on that. And I uh, just want to say a quick thank you to everybody that has been subscribing to the Remnant Call. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, Please, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Like us on Facebook. The, it, folks, we've got to continue to grow uh, so we can spread this word of not only warning, but the Remnant Call is also a program of hope about a deeper walk with the Lord. Because all the warning in the world won't save anybody. Only Jesus does the saving. And you've got to get in close, get in tight with him right now. This is the hour. This is the time. Put the foolishness away, and let's get serious about our walk with the Lord. Well, I'm not going to delay any longer. I'm going to bring on Brother Benjamin here with us tonight because we have had some recent developments, as you've seen, the election. And, boy, there has been a lot of words going on. So let's bring in Brother Benjamin to see what he has to say about what just transpired in the U.S. Benjamin, are you here with us? Well, good evening, Frank. How are you? Brother, I am just fine, and uh, thank you so much for joining in, and, and brother, I am looking forward to uh, tomorrow night's program with Jeff Nyquist, and uh, Benjamin, you two, when you all get together, it is amazing, and I'm telling you, I cannot wait, so thank you all for coming on in advance tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Well, you're welcome. I'm looking forward to the program with Jeff. Uh, there's a, certainly a lot going on on the international scene and uh, the, the Russian Ministry of Defense uh, formally announced publicly that they are preparing for war against the United States, a, defeat, a defensive war uh, to protect their country from what they believe is an inevitable uh, military attack by the United States. And, of course, we, we would never attack Russia, but it's the cover under which they are actually mobilizing. But that's a topic for tomorrow night. Tonight, let's talk about the most recent events here in the, the U.S. And, of course, probably the biggest news of this week was the midterm elections, Frank. And uh, the, the Christian community was, you know, rallying around the flag. Uh, and, and a lot of voices had come forward predicting a red tsunami, that there would be a, a tidal wave, a uh, Republican a uh, victory in which the Republicans would strengthen their hold over both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Frank, how, how did the red tsunami turn out? Well, Benjamin, I, I would like to um, read about that red tsunami, just a little short sentence and then comment on it. And this is from the Mark Taylor prophecy here on CBN News, just posted, I think it was two days ago. Uh, right before the election, this was what was said. The Lord spoke to me again as a sure sign of these things coming to pass. There will be a wave of conservatives elected during the midterm election in November 2018. It will break, be breaking news. They will carry the House and the Senate, the Senate, and I will uproot, replant, and rebuild the nation. So this is what was just prophesied. And as you can see, none of that came to pass. Now, we did still continue to be in charge of the, sen the Senate, but this red tsunami did not take place. Benjamin, I'm afraid there are too many voices speaking too much falsehood into the body of believers in this hour. Back to you, brother. Well, you know, our authority in this time is Holy Scripture. And our the ultimate test of any so-called prophetic word or any revelation, the ultimate test by which everything is measured is the Word of God. And 
so does the word of God talk about you know a sudden revival at the end of the age before the judgment hits the world? No, it's nowhere in the scripture. And you know the word of God is very clear. Once a nation is past the point of judgment, the only thing that could possibly turn back the hand of judgment would be national repentance. And what I find so amazing, Frank, is so many prophetic voices have come forward rallying around the flag and and you know rallying around the political party of of the conservatives of the Republican party and really almost equating a Republican victory to God's salvation of America without any without any focus at all on calling the church or the nation to repentance. Simply get out the Republican vote and you know we're going to turn this ship around and you know it's it's a well-intentioned, uh, optimistic opinion. You know, people want things to get better. That's certainly fine. But when you come forward and you prophesy that God has declared these things, and if these things, in fact, do not occur, then I think we have to conclude that those prophecies were false, and the men that brought them, the women that brought them, were, in fact, false prophets. And, and the the testimony of Jesus in Scripture is that at the time of the end, many false prophets would come. Many will come in my name and deceive many. And the word, as my listening audience knows, is polis in the Greek, and it means the vast majority. So today, there is a cacophony of prophetic voices. The vast majority of them are all false. And they've come to deceive the many. And the vast majority of the professing Christian church has, in fact, been deceived. A um, friend of mine wrote me an email and said, I'm all in for President Trump. I've gone all in. And I thought to myself, you know, wh- who is this? What have we elevated this man to? You know, is he our Messiah? I'm all in for Jesus Christ. You know, God bless President Trump. Pray for your president. But we are not going to make Babylon great again. And the firemen prophecies were completely false. There was no red tsunami. What's amazing, though, Frank, is some of these false prophets will go so far as to even deny reality. There's a, one of these false prophets is a woman who dyes her hair pink. She's a grandmother, yet she dresses sort of like a punk rocker, a teenager, or a grunge you know, rocker from their early 20s, complete with pink dyed hair. And, and she has claimed that no, these prophecies were true, and there was not a Democratic victory in, in the House of Representatives, that many of the newly elected Democrats are really closet Republicans, and blue, the color blue, is the new red. Okay, folks, if we're going to go as far as denying reality, we have, there, there's nothing left. I was talking with John Haller, who's a good friend of mine, and, and John was just saying, I, I, don't know what to, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to respond to this madness. I said, John, this madness has been going on inside the charismatic churches for several decades. This level of false prophetic words has been filling the airwaves. You know, the Elijah list is a false prophet's list. I don't read it. When it came out, I mean, I, it was ridiculous what was on it initially. I'm sure it's full of a bunch of self-promoted people who, I mean, look, some of these people are hearing voices. They're hearing voices from the other side. They're hearing the resonance of their own fractured soul. And perhaps they're hearing voices from the, the modern electrical technologies where, where the government, the beast, can put voices in your head. But in any event, they're not hearing the Lord. And they are not calling the people to repentance. Amen. But they are denying reality to claim that these false prophecies, in fact, were fulfilled. But the truth is, we did not have a red tsunami. We now have a divided Congress. And, you know, this is going to turn into chaos over the next year or two. Benjamin, it reminds me, this is what I'm having trouble with with all of these, because that particular prophecy that I read 
that was the second part of the first part about this amazing where Jesus was going to cover the nation with his blood. Salvation's coming all over. It's going to be great revival. And then that was going to be the sign. Uh, what it reminds me, though, is how contrary that is to the word of God. Behold, the days come in Amos, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And so if there's a famine in the land of hearing the true word of the Lord, and all these people continue to say these nonsense prophecies, and not only that, but say that God's going to bless us while we continue to kill babies, legalize abortion, sex trafficking. You know, I live in Virginia. Come to find out Richmond is like one of the capital hubs of this uh, nation right here of the sex trafficking that goes through. And yet God's going to just bless us as a nation as we embrace these things. It's utter, absolute madness. Back to you, brother. Well, well it is madness, but... Satan always brings out his final deception right before the judgment in order to confuse and divide the people of God. And if you look to the history in the book of Jeremiah, as Jeremiah was testifying before the king and before the nation that the judgment of God was coming and that Babylon was going to conquer all of Israel, including Jerusalem, and as the Babylonian conquest had begun, and the king had been taken in captivity, and a new king had been appointed by Babylon, a man came forward named Hananiah, and he prophesied, we are going to make Jerusalem great again. And within two years, the greatness of Jerusalem will be restored, and all of the articles of the temple worship that have been taken and basically stolen and carried off to Babylon, would be returned, and Jeremiah would be discredited as a false prophet. And I, the scripture doesn't tell us what the reaction of the crowd was, but I think from the, looking at our current time and place, the, no doubt the majority of the people began to cheer for Hananiah, because they wanted it to be so. The scripture tells us at the time of the end, that the church would no longer endure sound doctrine. You can't teach the truth to an American Christian. They can't endure it. Rather, they would be turned to fables, and they would turn their ears to the spirits that mutter in the dark. Their itching ears would seek out the pillow prophets who would prophesy of peace and prosperity, and so it is today. All of these prophets who are prophesying this nonsensical um, so-called restoration of America, they have left out the repentance from sin. And, and so they're really do, fulfilling the role of Hananiah. They've come in the, in the 11th hour, and they're here for the purpose of disarming the church. And, you know, if you look carefully at this fireman's prophecies, he's gone as far as saying that Trump will put the nation under martial law sometime, you know, in the future, and that during the martial law, the church should not be concerned because all of the evil officials will be getting arrested. And we need to go under martial law so they can drain the swamp and root out the deep state. But if in reality there were all of these sealed indictments that this QAnon character is, you know, Led, allegedly represented, if this was really happening, you don't need to put the nation under martial law to serve an arrest warrant on a criminal. But yet, Mr. Taylor has prophesied the nation will go under martial law and the church should just sit at home and don't be concerned. And, you know, and when they come for you, you know, and they put the little bracelets on your hands, don't be concerned. You know, no doubt it was just all a big mistake. Well, the big mistake was listening to false prophets. There's no question martial law is coming. The financial collapse is coming, Frank. In the real world, this thing is unwinding. And I've had some conversations with Doug Woodward and a few of his friends who are pretty intelligent guys, and, you know, we're debating. They were asking questions, rather. It really wasn't more a debate as much as a series of questions on, you know, could this current bubble in financial assets continue and could the stock market rally go higher and 
you know, and I've made the, the definitive statement, and this is not a prophecy, this is Benjamin as a chartered financial analyst with almost 50 years of experience studying these financial and investment markets, with my educational background in international finance, where I, my emphasis was on the post-Renaissance economic order. I studied the economic history of Europe and the United States starting in the 1500s, and I examined all of the data which has been created and retained for the last 500 years of economic history. And I can tell you this, every 70 to 80 years, the shadow government, the satanic elite, the international bankster families, and the so-called royal families that are controlling the system but through their control of the money-centered banks, they create a huge credit crisis where they take the system from a credit expansion where the, the value of everything is, is pushed up through the expansion of the credit. They create easy, cheap money where everybody can borrow from the banks, and it drives the prices higher and higher and higher. And then suddenly they, they turn off the credit, they turn off the cash flow, and without the debt to lift these asset values, guess what happens? The, the law of physics in finance takes over, and the gravity of excess leverage crashes asset values, and we go into something that you would describe as a Great Depression, a financial collapse, at the bottom of which the elites step in and they buy all the collapsed assets for pennies on the dollar. A bear market is the period of time in which the stocks return to their rightful owners, which are the financial elite. They're selling them now, and they're going to buy them back in a few years. No, no, that's the game, and they played it over and over and over again. And the common people never learn, because the common people never study. The common people don't know. They listen to the so-called experts, and they don't know. And so everybody's captured by the propaganda of the moment. And so here we are. Interest rates are rising. Financial crisis is already occurring in the weaker links of the global economic system. You've got entire countries that are, that are entering into the depression. The, the weaker economies are already turning over. And the United States, as a bastion of liquidity and safety, is receiving an inflow of investment capital. So, you know, this crisis hasn't yet appeared in its full magnitude, but it's coming the central bankers, the, the financial elite, have no reason to continue to reflate the bubble. The national debt is $22 trillion. At 5% interest, the interest rate on our federal deficit will bury the budget. The debt trap is now complete. The final nails are in the coffin. Further printing of money, further quantitative easing, further monetization will only damage the central banks and cause the global elite to lose money. But as the banks slowly raise interest rates and tighten up the credit standards, the laws of physics guarantee the outcome. A deflationary crash lies ahead, and every crash in the Western economies for the last 500 years, with the exception of Weimar Germany in the 1920s, has been deflationary. This time will be no different. If we had an inflationary meltdown, which would mean the central bank would just keep printing money at an accelerating rate to where inflation would suddenly spiral out of control, the value of the dollar would go to zero. The value of all of the collateral, the assets, the real estate, the, the, the real physical property, plant, and equipment in the country would rise with the inflation level, and the debtors, the people, the middle class, would be benefited, and the banks would be ruined. That is why every major financial crisis is a deflationary crisis where the asset values are crashed. They crash. And the people, the middle class, are crushed into poverty, and then the banks foreclose on everything that has been defaulted on. And the rich basically run the table, and then they do it again and again and again, and it's, you know, it's the same old game, but nobody ever learns. The downturn that is now beginning in our financial markets, which will definitely manifest in my professional opinion, and again, I'm not making a prophecy, I'm giving you my opinion as a chartered financial analyst and an economist who studied international finance, the next two years will witness the most violent financial meltdown 
ever to occur if we make it that far without World War III occurring. The banks and the elites have nothing to gain by extending the financial bubble from here. The American century is over. The reign of Babylon America is ending. And no one, I repeat, no one man can ever make Babylon great again. And, you know, this is just economic reality. And I can assure you this is what's happening. And, you know, there, there clearly is a shadow government that wants to destroy our freedoms and, and bring America to its knees. Could they reflate the bubble one more time for the next two or three years? Well, yes, of course, they, they have the financial power to do so. They control the banking system. Why would they do so? Do they want to make Donald Trump look good? Do they want the public to think that Trump's policies created a strong economy? Or would they rather bring the crash on so they can blame Trump's conservatism? And they can tell the voters in America, who are not the, sm the sharpest tools in the woodshed, by the way, they'll tell the voters, look, when you elected a socialist or a communist, the economy was great. And then you elect a conservative, and you have a financial crisis. And all these people who don't understand the basics of economics are going to run out and vote for socialism and communism, if we even end up with uh, free elections in the next two years. The party's over. There's no way to make America great again. The fact that these so-called prophets represented that God had revealed there would be a red tsunami and the Republicans would retain or strengthen their hold in the House proves emphatically these men are false prophets. The whole concept that you could somehow turn the corner for America, we're bankrupt. The nations of the world support our economy. It is levitating on printed money. And the only way the printed money retains its value is our trading partners in the Middle East and in China and Japan and in Europe are willing to take our dollars in exchange for the goods and services we must import in order to maintain the standard of living, in order to continue the welfare state, in order for our capitalist system to operate at a profit, in order for all of this to be maintained, our trading partners have to absorb between $600 billion, $700 billion, at times a trillion dollars a year, financial outflows through the trade deficit and fiscal deficit, and then they have to recirculate that money back into the United States bond market by buying the federal debt. As soon as that game stops, as soon as Saudi Arabia says, you know what, I think I want you to pay me in gold or euros or the Chinese yuan or any basket of currencies other than just more printed dollars, the economic shell game is over, the house of cards will crumble, and this thing is going to be the biggest financial meltdown in the history of the modern world, and it's going to occur at lightning speed, and suddenly this great prosperity will be gone, and the asset values will collapse, stock market down 30, 50, 70 percent, bond market down 30, 40, 50 percent, real estate down 30, 40 percent. Pension plans, insolvent, upside down. City, state governments, bankrupted. Services discontinued. Riots in the street. And yes, you know, the two sides that now hate each other, they've really done the job of creating the contention. The red horse of war, as I mentioned many times, has already been released and is creating conflict at an interpersonal level. Friends, family members who are conservative and liberal cannot even talk to each other today. And the liberals are literally standing outside the homes of conservative journalists and threatening them. They're calling for violent acts. And violence is coming. It's in Jeremiah 50. There shall be violence in the land and ruler against ruler. And we are entering that moment of time and that's the final event before the fall of America Babylon and the words of a false prophet will not change this. All the wishful thinking will not change this. All the pie-in-the-sky Pollyanna prophecies cannot change the reality of what we are facing. And the only one that could change the destiny of America is the Lord. And in order for that to happen, America would have to repent. America was once great because America was good. 
And Tocqueville, who, who made that quote back in the early 1800s, he said, America is great for only one reason. It's because America is good. The people in America 200 years ago, for the most part, were good people. They were Bible-believing people. They, they were people that were trying to do what was right in the eyes of God. And yes, there were sins, and yes, there were problems, and all, it wasn't a perfect country or a perfect society. But compared to the America of today, the America of, of 1819 was good compared to the America of 2019. You watch the television, and now you're getting homosexual couples on TV commercials. And if you haven't already turned off your television, it's probably time to do so. You're probably late to the game of getting out of that, of that machine. But, you know, my point being this, all of the objective measures of reality are telling us the system is going to crash. Then we have a few false prophets who are telling us that the Democrats that were elected are really closet Republicans and that the blue wave that just occurred in the House was really a red wave. I mean, the, Frank, these people are in denial of reality. Well, Benjamin, it's, it's worth, really reminds... It's wishful thinking. It's magical thinking. It, it reminds me of Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And the 400 prophets that came up there and saying, yeah, go up and prosper, you know, do all these things, it's great, you know, you're, you're wonderful. And finally Jehoshaphat looks over and he, and, and he says, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire him? And Jehoshaphat's like, is, okay, I hear the 400, but is there anybody actually speaks on behalf, and then, you know, he's like, Ahaz, like, well, yeah, there's this one, Micaiah, but, you know, he never says anything good. You know, and that's what I feel like today. We, we've got this false sense of, I don't want to hear the truth anymore. I want to live in this false fantasy of making Babylon great again so I can live in my prosperity of babies dying and open homosexuality and say, God bless this nation. And I, folks, listen, I served my country. So did Benjamin. We loved this country, but the fact is reality. We're embracing things that are contrary to the very word of God. And then we're saying, God, just bless us all over while we continue down this path. The fact is, folks, we need to be worried about reaching the lost, changing lives for Jesus. Because this, if you are thinking that Babylon's just going to turn around and get back on the right track, well, God can do anything, but the Word of God doesn't actually point to that. It says, come out of her, my people, be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. Benjamin, back to you, brother. Amen, brother. Uh, I was in prayer today, and, and in my prayer loft, and in asking the Lord, you know, what is, what is your word to the people to, in this hour, in this time? And brother, the Lord led me to the book of Micah, and I began reading in chapter 1. And, and I'll start with verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah in the days of Hezekiah, which he saw, he saw this word concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Hear all you people and hearken, listen. This word was to all of the people. O earth, and it wasn't just for the people of Samaria and Jerusalem. It was to the entire earth that Micah spoke. And all that are therein, okay, that includes everyone on the earth. So if, to any of my listeners, to our listeners tonight, if you are still on the earth, I am talking to you. And the word goes on and says, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, brother and sister, and against me, and against Frank, and against all of us. This is what Micah wrote. The true word of God today has come forth as a witness against all of the people of the earth. And it is a warning that we might take heed and repent and turn from our wicked ways that we could be preserved in a judgment that is about to begin. And the scripture says, let the Lord God be the witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple, because God's judgment is going to be executed in righteousness, overflowing in righteousness and in holiness. And the Lord says in Micah verse 3, For behold, the Lord is coming forth 
out of his place, and he will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. The Lord's coming, people. And when he gets here, in verse 4, it says, The mountains will melt like wax underneath him, and the valleys shall be cleft, they'll be cut asunder, as wax before the fire, and as water that is poured down on a steep place. This is going to be a flood of water, and it is going to come crashing down, for the transgression of Jacob is all of this. And for the sins of the house of Israel. And what is the transgression of Jacob? And what are the sins of America? And the scripture says, and what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? Whoa! Stop and think, my friend. God's rebuke of Judah and his rebuke of his people, his rebuke of Israel, was Jerusalem. Well, what was wrong with Jerusalem? It was full of false prophets who would not uncover the sin of the people, but they were prophesying a return to the greatness and the, and the prosperity and the pleasures and the hedonism. And the people were seeking their, pre- their pleasure, and they had turned their back on the Lord, and they did so in Jerusalem, and then they justified it, saying, we have the temple of the Lord, we have the Ark of the Covenant, we have the descendants of Abraham, and no judgment will ever come unto us. And so, too, the word against Samaria. What was in Samaria? The high places where the people worshipped in a way that was right in their own eyes. And you've got a church today doing what is right in their own eyes. I'm all in for Trump, they say. What are you, nuts? We need to go all in for Jesus. You want to pray for Trump? Pray for him. You want to fast and pray for America? That's between you and the Lord. I would admonish everyone to be fasting and praying in this hour. But I would suggest you not prophesy that pigs could fly, that you not prophesy that the laws of financial physics will be overturned. It would take a divine act to save this country. Our enemies are openly and, and have verbally acknowledged they are preparing for war against us. Saudi Arabia today literally publicly declared they are considering breaking up OPEC. Why would Saudi want to end OPEC? So they could walk away from their support of the petrodollar. As soon as the petrodollar is over, the United States will enter the deepest depression of its history. It will be a financial collapse without remedy. And where will the false prophets be? Where will the pink-haired lady run to? No doubt they will disappear. She will change her hair color, so maybe she won't be as visible. But what... Where will the people that listened to the false prophets, where will they appear? The Lord says, I will make Samaria a heap of a field, and it's the planting of a vineyard, and I will pour down the stones thereof into the valley, and I will discover the foundations. The vineyards had walls around them to protect them. The Lord said, I'm knocking down the walls, and I'm going to throw the stones into the bottom of the valley, even unto the foundation. Well, we're talking about making a wall. We're going to build a wall to, to stop the enemies of America from pouring through, in, along with all of the migrants who've come for, for economic opportunity. They've come to ex- escape the poverty of the satanic systems under which they were raised. But along with these refugees, along with these migrant illegal aliens who've come enemies, They've crept in as caterpillars. So we're talking about building a wall. We should have built the wall 40 years ago, people. There's 40 million here illegally, and that's not the problem. The problem is there's several million enemy special forces troops that have come in as well. They're going to be the problem. MS-13 is the problem. The hardcore gangs and criminals, the drug distributors, the satanic element that came in among them, that is the problem. And the Lord says, I'm tearing down your wall. Uh, all thoughts, you know, all this talk about building a wall. Have we built the wall? Oh, a couple, a few feet of barbed wire. Hey, great. You know, whatever. Do what you can. The problem is, when the Lord has decreed judgment, it cannot be stopped. They're overturned by the acts of men. God says, I will break the graven images and beat them into pieces. And Micah then says, therefore, I'm going to wail and howl. Now, I'm yelling a little bit tonight. 
I'm howling tonight. I'll make the wailing like a jackal, and I'll mourn like an owl, for the wound of my people is incurable. This was true of Israel before they went into captivity. It is true of America today. The wounds are incurable. They cannot be cured by voting Republican. And friends, I would have loved to have seen a red tsunami. But I'm not deceived into thinking that these Republican candidates, these Republican politicians, are somehow going to save us. Yeah, it's better if we don't continue down the road of so socialism, communism, and the surrender of our liberties. Absolutely, we all support this. But let's stop kidding ourselves. It wasn't a red victory on election night. We did keep the Senate. And, and maybe that will soften you know, the fact that Trump's in and the fact that some of these things are good. Maybe it will soften, if you will, or it will, it will create an opening for the deliverance of the remnant. But it will not save America because it can not save America because the wound in, in the nation itself is incurable. It has come unto the gate of the nation. The people are waiting for good, verse 12. But evil came down from the Lord under the gate of Jerusalem. Micah chapter 1, verse 12, King James Version. For the inhabitants of Maroth waited carefully for good. The people are waiting for these prophecies to be fulfilled. They're waiting for all the indictments. They're waiting for the deep state to be arrested. They're waiting for all of this return of greatness. But this is not what's coming. And rather, evil came down from the Lord. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't think the Lord ever sent evil. Right? The American church doesn't think that the God, the eternal God of heaven, would ever send evil upon an evil nation. But in fact, the scripture is abundantly clear. If there be evil in the city, hath the Lord not sanctioned it, hath the Lord not commanded it, no, this is a time. This is a time to depart and leave them. Chapter two, verse ten: Arise and depart, for this is not a place of rest. You you cannot rest on the words of the false prophets, you guys. These words are polluted; they will destroy you. In verse eleven, if a man walks in a, in the spirit of falsehood and lies, saying, "I'll prophesy unto you of wine and strong drink." Good times are coming back. He will be the prophet of his people. The breakers come up upon you, my friends. Thus says the Lord, chapter 3, verse 5, Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that led the people of God into error. They bite with their teeth, and they cry peace and prosperity. And he that putteth not into their mouth, they prepare war against. If you don't feed their ego, and you don't give them money, if you stand up and, and you don't stand with them, they prepare war against you. And what does the scripture say? Therefore, they shall have a night. Night shall be unto you. And these prophets shall not have vision. They will not have a vision. And it shall be dark unto you. And you will not divine, and the sun will go down over the false prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then the seers will be ashamed, and the diviners, the false prophets, confounded. And they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. But truly I am full of the power by the Spirit of the Lord, and of his judgment, and of his might, to declare unto Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin, and the, the message the, the responsibility, the mission of the true prophetic voice is to declare to the people of God their transgression and to reveal to the people their sin, that they might repent and turn away from all of this wickedness. Because only a remnant is going to be saved now. The judgment is determined. It shall surely come. It cannot be changed because the scripture tells us it comes at the appointed time. And we are not changing the appointment, my friends. There was a time appointed. You know, and the scripture says, my people know not the judgment of their God. They know not the time of judgment because they don't want to know. 
If you just open your eyes, look around you, the warning signs are everywhere. Yet the people cannot endure the truth. And so they gather together pillow prophets who preach and teach pleasant things. We're going to make life great again. You're going to be rich again. You can keep your NFL football. You can drink your beer and have your barbecue on Sunday after church. And, and you can keep all your other sin and compromise. Sixty percent of the pastors in America are addicted to pornography. This is Josh McDowell is my site. I just saw a, a video of him. You want to go find this? He, he did a piece on this very recently. I think it was something like 70% of the men in the Christian church regularly, at least once a month, visit pornography sites on the Internet. And we're going to make the church great again without repentance? I, I, I heard the report of a man who, who was a Christian, he was a youth pastor, and, and I, I just heard a report, this man has two young girls in their early 20s living in his house with him, and they're both, these girls are doing heroin. And why is he giving them free rent? This is a pastor, former pastor. Well, the sins of this nation have reached unto heaven, my friends. I, I encourage you to, to pray without ceasing that you and your household might escape what is coming soon upon this land. Frank, are you familiar with The Economist magazine and, and you know, the cover that they produce each year that is a, a picture of what the next year would hold? In 2015 and 2016, the cover showed all the political leaders of the world, and in a series of cartoon caricatures of the different issues and conflicts that were attending to the matters of state. And then in 2017, the cover was a series of tarot cards in which the elite presented, you know, the, the picture of the Trump election is something they permitted, and that their plan was to lead humanity into chaos, lead mankind over the edge of the abyss, and that the Great War, their planned outcome was World War III, and that it was written in the stars and it couldn't be changed. That this outcome was destiny and was being controlled by spiritual forces. That was essentially the message on the cover of the magazine. Then last year, the cover for 2018 was a series of icons, no longer even people, just computer images as virtual reality. You know, as a false reality began to take control of the planet, artificial intelligence is beginning to rise up, if you will, out of the sea. A beast came forth, and it's, this image will talk. It's going to become alive. It's already alive and among us. You know, quantum mechanics is almost a form of sorcery, if you really study it carefully. But then the magazine, Frank, have you seen the cover for 2019? It's, it, no. Basically it says the year 2019 in white, and then the whole cover is black. I'm looking at the future it up right shall now. be dark. Night shall come upon you, and your future shall be black. And the sun will go down, and the day shall darken over your heads. And your prophets will be ashamed, and your pastors and your priests will wail and weep, for no one saw this coming. But the scripture tells us at the time of the end, there would be men of insight who would come and give wisdom and understanding to the many, and not prophets. They just came forward to share the truth of Holy Scripture. And the truth is, the judgment's about to begin, my friends. The financial system is rolling over. The elite are going to burn this thing down on Trump's watch, and they're going to blame him. And there's nothing we can do about it. The dollar, the value of the U.S. dollar is ultimately determined in China and in Saudi Arabia, and in Europe, and in Japan, and in South Korea. It is not determined in Washington anymore. And when our trading partners abandon our dollar, this financial system will let go. So if any of you are, are speculating on becoming wealthy in, in the wealth of Babylon on the, on the eve of her judgment, 
well, then I think you perhaps should be on the short side instead of the long side of the trade. But, but really, it's not, it's not going to matter how much wealth any of us had, whether you have a little or whether you have a lot. It's meaningless in the world that we're walking into. The only thing that matters is whether you have the favor of the Lord, whether the Lord has given the commandment to deliver you. And if you're walking uprightly with the Lord, if you are his servant, and you know, none of us are perfect. You know, we, we all have attitude ish- issues. We all have things where God is still refining us. I'm not, I'm not talking about being perfect, but I'm talking about people who are willing to take an honest look in the mirror and say, you know what, that's me. I need to repent. I've got, I've got anger issues or pride issues. or There's things in my heart that are not yet sanctified. And I need to deal with this stuff with the Lord. And, you know, I mean, I'm not even talking about you know, the people that are still smoking marijuana or doing drugs or illicit sex. Okay, guys, those are way off limits. That's a death sentence today. And I'm putting Internet pornography on the list of sexual sins. These are sins that will kill you. They will kill your family. It will kill your children. Is it really worth it? Yes. Are your sins that important to you that you're willing to lose your life to keep them? And believe me, the Scripture says that the Lord is going to bring forth a judgment so severe no one has even heard of the evil that is coming. No one's ever even seen the judgment that is coming. It's beyond the comprehension of men how severe the judgment that is going to come in this hour. But at the same time, the Lord says, in that day, I will assemble together those that were limping, those that were wounded, those who were disabled, and I will gather together the ones that were driven out, the outcasts and the afflicted, and the ones that I afflicted, the Lord says. This is in Micah 4, verse 6. And I will make the ones who were halted, who were limping, the ones whose, whose bones were out of joint, I will make them a remnant. And the ones that were cast off, the ones that were the outcasts, I will turn them into a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this moment, from henceforth, even forever. And the kingdom and the dominion will be restored And then it says in verse 10, Micah 4, verse 10, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. And and indeed, the time of travail is coming, and the birth of of the anointed ones is at hand. The time of travail is upon us now, and you will go forth out of the city. Probably a good thing to consider doing in the near future. Get out of those cities, and you will dwell in the field. And you shall go even in Babylon, and there you shall be delivered. And there the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. Hallelujah. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron. And the horn is the symbol of power. I'm going to put the power in the hand of my remnant. It's going to be in the form of a rod of iron. And I will make your hoofs brass. And brass is a symbol of the judgment. It's a symbol of the burning fire of judgment. Lives that have walked through the judgment, that have now been sanctified. Your feet will be as bronze, as brass. For my people, their lives, their feet have been cleansed. God didn't just wash these feet. He burned them in the fire. And having been burned in the fire, now the sin and the dross are gone. And you shall beat into pieces many people. Yeah. This is what it says in the scripture. It's going to get serious soon. And I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. We don't need to worry about, you know, what are we going to eat and what are we going to wear and where are we going to stay and who, you know, how are we going to meet our, who's going to provide for us? The Lord will protect those that are his. And he'll provide for them in every way. And the scripture says the remnant shall eat the good of the land. God's going to provide the good, even the best. And out of Bethlehem, Ephratah, though Bethlehem be among the thousands of Judah, out of Bethlehem will come forth 
one who is to be the ruler in Israel, who will sit and rule from the throne of David. And his going forth has been from old, even from everlasting. And then the Lord says, and you guys go study this one carefully, Micah 5, verse 3, Therefore he will give them up. The Lord will give them up. Who is he giving up? He's giving up Israel. He's giving up his people. And even today, he's given up the church. I'm sorry, folks. The Lord has left most churches. And the ones that he hasn't altogether forsaken, he's getting ready to purge them. The churches have fallen into apostasy. Strong delusion has come down. The people have wandered off into a way that seemed right in their own eyes. The Lord says, therefore, he will give them up until the time that she which travails has brought forth the birth of the man-child. And then the remnant of the brethren, of his brethren, the remnant of God's people, the remnant of the disciples of Jesus Christ will return. They will be joined together with the remnant of Israel. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Now, who is the he of this verse? I'm looking at Micah 5, verse 4. Is it the Lord Jesus? He will stand and feed in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, the name of his Father, and they shall abide. And now he shall be great unto the ends of the earth. And this man, which man? The man Jesus Christ, who also is the Lord God Almighty, he will be our peace. When the war comes, when the Assyrians come, when the Antifa crazies come, when the servants of the beast come, when they tread into our land, then we will raise up seven shepherds and an eighth principal man. And who are the seven shepherds? They are the seven apostles of the seven churches of the book of Revelation. And who is the eighth principal man who stands with them? He is the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, and the seven stand with the Lord. And we, they will be lifted up. We will raise up against him seven shepherds, and an eighth principal man will be among them, and they will lay waste to the land of the Assyrians with the sword, and the land of Nimrod, the land of Babylon, and the entrances thereof. And the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people, as do from the Lord. They're going to be full of the living water, and as a shower upon the grass, and they tarry not for man, nor wait for the sons of men, and the remnant of Jacob will be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the field, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep or goats, who, if they go through, both tread down and tear into pieces, and none can deliver, and their hand will be lifted against their enemies, and all their enemies shall be cut off. Hallelujah. And the Lord goes on at the end of Micah 5, and he says, and I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have never heard. You take the worst thing you've ever heard of the fury and the vengeance that's come forth on this planet throughout the 6,000 years of history. And what's about to happen is worse than anything you've ever heard. But the Lord is going to protect his people. Hallelujah. And so what do we do? Well, the scripture is very clear in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. The Lord has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what you should do, and what the Lord requires of you, that you do justice, and you love mercy, and you learn to walk humbly with your God. For the Lord's voice crieth out unto the city of Babylon, and the men of wisdom, they shall know your name, they see your name, Babylon, and you will indeed hear ye the rod, and the one who hath appointed it in this hour. The false prophets, they will be blown away by the winds that are coming, and the only ones that will be speaking in that hour will be the ones whom the Lord has appointed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The time is at hand, brother. The time is Amen. truly at hand. Yes, it is. Benjamin, um, I, I feel like, you know, there you talked about all the real problems that are going on in the church. And folks, I just want to say, 
there are so many struggles that so many people are facing. And, and we got to unplug out of this world and plug into the Lord. That's how you overcome addiction. That's how you overcome these things. Folks, I'm telling you, as a person who spent a lifetime, long years of drug addiction, I can tell you it wasn't till the moment that the Lord broke me till I had nothing left uh, inside me anymore, and I finally cried out to him, and he was so ready to save. But this hope in this false revival of this country is distracting from the deep inner relationship of prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord so that you can have peace in the midst of tribulation. That's the great promise that God has, is that even when this everything's going dark in this world, that the Lord can bring His peace to those that follow and trust Him. And this is the hour. This is the time. The book of Micah just laid out this last days extremely, extremely well. And Benjamin, I want to say thank you so much for bringing this up. It, it's time to unplug. It's time to turn off the distractions, turn down what's taking you away. If you look at all the times that we have struggles in our walk with the Lord from not spending enough time, it's all because we are distracted with the machine of Babylon, whether it's Babylon's technology, whether it's Babylon's TV, whether it's things that are in this nation that help us to have this so-called luxurious life. You look at the distractions when it's work or whatever it might be. Folks, time to shut it off, put it down, and let's get serious with God. Benjamin, would you close us out tonight in a word of prayer? Um, and I want to say thank you so much for sharing from what was on your heart out of the book of Micah. Uh, and, and just help the people right now, especially those that are struggling, Benjamin. You could just pray that the Lord would, would keep his people and would strengthen those who are in their struggle. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we all look to you and you alone. Lord, I pray you would touch every heart of every listener. And Lord, that you would uncover our sin. Lord, show us mercy and open our eyes and uncover the sin areas in our lives and lead us to true repentance, Lord, that we might be restored in holiness in our walk before you and that we might know what to do. And, Lord, help us to turn away from the things of Babylon. Help us, Lord, to come out from among them and to touch not the unclean things, that we would find the time to seek you in prayer to seek you in times of prayer and fasting, and to seek your word of truth through, through the diligent study and meditation in your holy scriptures. I pray, Lord, for those who are struggling and who feel like they're losing the battle, people that, who are being overwhelmed by fear and, and accusations of hopelessness by the enemy. I pray, Lord, you would send your angels into their midst and that you would touch them with your finger. Lord, touch them with a, a coal of fire that, from the altar that burns in the heavens, Lord, and, and re restore strength to them spiritually, Lord. Increase their faith. Kindle hope within them, Lord. And give them strength to fight. Lord, I pray that you would birth prayer groups, and, Lord, that you would bring people together in, in teams of prayer where people could pray with another, where the prayer of two or more could come forth with authority to overturn the satanic attack against your people and against our families and against our children, Lord, that we might be the men who heard the, the cry from heaven and stood up and began to stand in the gap for our families, for our loved ones, for our friends, that the remnant might be preserved out of the judgment that is soon going to fall upon this nation. And I ask, Lord, that your perfect will would be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Benjamin, thank you so much for being here with us. Folks, keep praying. Keep seeking the Lord. Yes, it is judgments coming. There are dark times ahead. But God promised to protect and to be there for us. And no matter what situation we are in, whether it's good or bad, the Lord said, I will never leave thee nor 
forsake thee, and you can take that one to the bank. It's in the word of God, and he stands true to his word. This is Brother Frank and Brother Benjamin with the Remnant Call saying to everyone, good night and shalom.